Who killed Jesus? Was it the Jews? Was it the Romans? The answer is not as simple as you think. There is no question that the Jews called for the death of Jesus when they were given a choice by the Roman governor Pontius Pilate to release a convicted criminal named Barabbas or to release Jesus. They made their choice without hesitation. Pilate protested, as he could find no fault in Jesus. Despite the objections of Pontius Pilate, the crowd called for the death of Jesus as they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! The only reason the Jews did not take Jesus to some remote spot and stone him to death themselves, which was the Jewish form of capital punishment, was the fact that the Romans had removed the scepter from Judah. In Genesis 49.10, we read this prophecy. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Shiloh is Messiah. This prophecy is dated to around 1700 B.C. and was fulfilled when Jesus was around 12 years old, about 20 years before his crucifixion. In other words, the Romans and the Romans alone were responsible for carrying out, and by a means most horrible, capital punishment. So you might be tempted to answer the question of who killed Jesus by acknowledging that it was a joint venture initiated by the Jews and carried out with cruel precision by the Romans. Does this answer satisfy you? Would you be surprised if I told you that there was one other person who was complicit in the death of Jesus, one person who orchestrated the entire drama and without whose consent none of it would have ever taken place? Without this person, who we are told was joyful about the prospect of the death of Messiah, who is this person who delighted in the prospect of the death of Jesus without whose permission it would never have happened? Without whose consent there would have been no thorn-pierced brow? Without this person's consent, Messiah would have never experienced even one cruel lash of the whip, nor one excruciating nail driven into his hands and feet, and never ever would a crude Roman spear have driven into his side. Do you know who this person is? Are some of you thinking perhaps it was Satan, the one who filled the Jews with such hatred for their Messiah that they would call a curse upon themselves and a blood curse upon their children in order to rid themselves of this person, Jesus? If you're a follower of Christ, then you know who that person is. Yes, the one person who took the ultimate and authoritative responsibility for the horrible death of Jesus was none other than Jesus himself. In John ten seventeen through 18 we read this, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. In Hebrews 12, 2 we read, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Listen to this who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. There is no discussion about the death of Jesus that cannot include the weight of the entire revelation from Genesis to the prophet Malachi, who gave us a hint as to the day Messiah would arrive on the earth and be crucified. Malachi 4.2 says this, but unto you that fear my name shall the Son, S-U-N, the Son of Righteousness, arrive with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Why does Malachi proclaim Son, S-U-N, instead of Son, S-O-N? It was a clue, a clue that we will investigate in the next couple of minutes. But first, let's listen to what Jesus told the unbelieving Pharisees who both witnessed and heard firsthand testimony regarding the miracles of Jesus. And yet, they asked Jesus for one more sign, a sign that he was truly the Messiah of Israel. Listen to what Jesus said to them, as recorded in Matthew twelve thirty nine. But he answered and he said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. In the first chapter of the Gospel of John, we learn that Jesus was the creator, the light of the world. 
Keep this verse in mind as we consider its prophetic significance when it comes to the day that Jesus would willingly give up his life in order that sinful man might be saved. In John 1, 1 1-4, we read this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Do you really imagine that there is even one tiny detail regarding the incarnation, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that was not planned by God the Father and God the Son from the beginning, including the day on which he would willingly and joyfully give up his life? Dispensationalism, a word that is contained in the Bible, is out of favor with most Christians. Why? Well, I would caution you to be very careful what you say about dispensational patterns and types, since it was God's Son that both revealed the shadows and the types and revealed the word dispensation. A word that properly understood is at the heart of the teaching of Scripture regarding Christ coming into the world in order to complete the most important dispensation in all the world. We read in Galatians 4.4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. And in Ephesians 1.10 we read that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him. Before we take a detective's magnifying glass to the question of when Jesus died on the cross, let's take a telescope and see if we can find a pattern and type that will support the fourth day crucifixion of Jesus. Of course, Wednesday is a word honoring the false pagan god Woden used on the Roman calendar, so I will just take my clue from the scriptures and simply call it the fourth day. Why would Jesus choose the fourth day as the day of the week, the most important event to ever take place in human history, would take place? The answer can only be found by viewing these events through a day for a thousand year biblical dispensational lens. Let's return to the creation account found in Genesis chapter 1 to see if we can discover the clue that will unwrap this mystery. What happened on the fourth day? In Genesis 1, 14 through 19, we find the answer. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. The evening and the morning were the fourth day. God placed lights in the firmament on the fourth day? Some have speculated that this was to warn us against a cosmology that made the sun the center of our universe. I think there's truth in that, but there's another reason, a prophetic dispensational reason, something stupendous that the Lord has prophetically announced by way of the original creation account. And if you have your spiritual radar working, you already know the answer. I believe, without apologizing to anyone, that God has given man one week with each day lasting 1,000 years and totaling 7,000 years. The question is, when did this 7,000-year countdown start? Some believe it started with creation, but that's not correct. It can't be. It started with the exact day that sin entered the world, the event that sent all creation into spiritual darkness and confusion. From perfection to putrefaction in the blink of an eye, a 7,000-year period given to man that began with the sin of Adam, who was around 33 and a half years old at the time he sinned. This is also the prophetic time period that would be a type and pattern for the last Adam, Jesus, who lived around 33 and a half years before he willingly died on a rude wooden cross to reverse the curse of the first Adam, the first Adam that had brought sin into the world. Jesus fulfilled the fourth day of a creation narrative in which each day represents a thousand years. When Jesus died on the cross on the fourth day, it was meant to notify us that a prophetic pattern was in the works. The death of Jesus as a picture going into the tomb at the very moment the fourth prophetic day that represented 1,000 years was about to end and the fifth day that represented 1,000 years was about to begin represented by 12 hours of darkness followed by 12 hours of light. 
There are no partial days in this prophetic outline based on the creation week. There is no Friday crucifixion in this prophetic harbinger, as it simply is both impossible and does not fit the prophetic pattern that God has established from the beginning of creation with the revelation of six days followed by the seventh day of rest. And when will this prophetic 1,000-year-for-a-day pattern end? Starting with the end of the fourth day, three literal days later, each day being 1,000 years. That's when it will end. To be clear, the cross event and the resurrection after three days is the ultimate sign of the end of the 7,000 years of man's work. This is the period that ends with the 1,000-year reign of Jesus that ends in, unbelievably, rebellion and unbelief among the earth dwellers as the heart of man even under the rulership of Jesus, remains wicked and rebellious to the core. In other words, Jesus died as a prophetic sign that the fourth day, the day that is in the middle of the week of years and in the middle of God's 7,000 years for man that began 4,000 years earlier, the day that the first Adam sinned and sent the world into spiritual darkness, that that day will come to an end after the completion of the three days that are each 1,000 years that bring us to the end of the 7,000th year pictured as the Saturday or the Sabbath. Once that day ends, there is no more night, no more darkness. Let me add one more prophetic detail to this that will help you understand why Jesus died on the fourth day and where we are on God's calendar of upcoming events. We know that Jesus, after rising to his Father, on the Sunday following the resurrection from the dead, returned to earth where he was seen and touched only by loving hands. Jesus ministered truth, grace, and comfort for 40 days before ascending up into the clouds where he was seen no more. We know where he is. He is in heaven. He did not leave without giving us the blessed hope that he would one day return. Listen to what it says in John 14, starting with verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. If you think that Jesus did not give us a clue as to when he was coming back, you're mistaken. Listen to what it says in Hosea 6.6. 6. Come, and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Who is this written to? This isn't written to Christians. This is written to the Jews. This is written to Israel. Now let's put this together with the dispensational pattern. The Lord has revealed. He left at the very end the twilight of the fourth day, which ended a 1,000 year age. We are told He is coming back after two days or 2,000 years, which brings us to the twilight of the sixth day. This is a twinkling of time away from the seventh day, the promised day that is 1,000 years of rest, that we call the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, that lasts for 1,000 years. Are you seeing the bigger picture? Do you see how the fourth day crucifixion followed by the resurrection after three days fulfills God's prophetic week in which each day is a thousand years, completing a 7,000 year period that will be followed by eternal light, no night, and the continual, never-ending fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ? I hope this helps you understand why the Lord must be crucified on a Wednesday, and he was. <laughs> 